ginormous suitcases for the stewardess, and they allowed you to take two on board, packed to the gills with black whack Colombian weed. Oh my god! And smile and just bring the two cases onto the airplane, fly to New York, take a cab, and take it up some stairs. I did that. How did you mask the smell? I wore perfume, and I had, I wore garters and beautiful short skirts. Oh yeah, you're a tall, beautiful woman. People, I took advantage of my good looks in a way that furthered people to believe me. I don't mean to come off any other way, but it helped me. It furthered me to be. I couldn't have done it if I was a guy, and I was wearing designer clothes, and I was. I took my daughter when she was six years old to、uh, France and London and bought her all her school outfits. But what she didn't know is I brought over close to you know seven hundred thousand dollars on my body strap. But we had a great vacation. Like Peach Blossom and women throughout history, Candy Can uses her beauty to her advantage. All resources are an asset. Candy Can says that her first marriage was tumultuous. Like my parents, she's avidly against cocaine and hard drugs. Her husband, though, was an addict and using coke all the time. He also started smuggling cocaine. One day, she came home to her husband and toddler to discover cocaine lying out on the table within reach of her kid. That's when she knew she had to leave him. And he took my daughter, and he left me in a house with no money and all. He took everything. He absolutely took everything, and I had bills. And I didn't have my daughter, so I put the word out because I knew everyone, and I started driving truckloads of marijuana between Miami and New York. And each truckload, I'd get twenty grand at a pop, and then I would, I managed to get make enough money to hire the best attorney in New York to prove that he was lying and that I deserved to have my kid. And I got my kid back. And I retired for a little bit. So Candy Can becomes a single mother, and along with the legal bills to win custody of her child, life is expensive. Street jobs don't pay nearly enough. It's really hard to make twelve dollars an hour and raise a family. It's really hard, and I wanted to provide the best, so I started. Working for some people on the West Coast, and I just didn't go back to my straight job. I just stayed in California and said, "Screw this! I'm I'm going to be have time with my kid." And I stayed in California, and we were at this point having sophisticated electronics. This is the first time that you did you weren't hired to sit in a house twenty four hours. A day in case the phone rang and it was the people. So you sit by a phone like twenty four hours, twenty four seven. Yeah, that 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 was your job. Wow. How much were you paid to do that? When the deal came through, I would get a box of money. I sent my daughter to school with a shoebox and she had money in it. I said, "Here's your college education." She has a lucky streak with her colleagues. Boatload after boatload is coming in, but then her associates got busted. <laughs> They were coming to the house, and I managed to escape. They, it was very close because I had rented all the houses, and there was the man was coming to the house, and I don't know what got me out of there, but I had to go do something for my kid or something, and I left the house, and they came, and I wasn't there, and I escaped, and it was touch and go. I had to live very differently after that. She moves with her daughter to Hawaii in a communications position. Now, this is someone who relays info between smugglers, like when loads come in and where they're offloaded. She deals with the logistics, like bill paying for the safe houses, trucks, phones, pagers, etc. She's the intermediary between the big international smugglers and the offloaders, transporters, and distributors, like my dad and his buddies. So we were the anti-networkers. We would have to wait in separate rooms while certain people came in and out. No one could meet anyone because if one person got busted, they could snitch you out. 
We were the absolute anti-network. No one knew anybody's name. We didn't want to know each other's name. I had many different nicknames. And sometimes we would all be together, and the only way you could communicate is if you were at a certain payphone at a certain hour on a certain day. Candy Can has another child with a smuggler who unfortunately gets busted and goes to a Thai prison for 12 years. And I'm penniless with a baby and a daughter and everything's gone like that. And I had to do things that were essential, like take the stroller into the supermarket, buy some food, but throw in the milk underneath the kid because I couldn't afford all the food. It was tough. I ended up having to give up my identity, which was so real that I had four birth certificates for my son. I thought, well, I don't know how, if we're going to have to move or what or this or that, and it was a home birth, so I got four birth certificates for him. So we left Hawaii, and we had to travel and not even go in the country in case there was an indictment for me. My lawyer said, leave the country. She starts traveling, visits the West Coast acid King Owsley, who had moved to Australia in the 80s. This was a somewhat common place for the psychedelic pioneers of my subculture to go when things got too hot at home. Visit Owsley in Australia. So once things settle down and became less hot, Candy Can heads back to the States yet again. She gets straight jobs. But once again, a single mother of two needs money to live on. So once again, she jumps back into smuggling. It's the early 1990s. So we get a good run. We're bringing in shit left and right, and the man is on our tail like Tom and Jerry. We're... We slip out the door, they're over there. Everything was just surreal to think that I lived that life. As my lawyer told me later, no one would believe it. She's on a delivery job, and she hires this driver on recommendation from a friend. And that's when everything falls apart. I hired a driver from a friend. He goes into the bar. And drinking, and he starts, somebody in the bar said, hey, do you know where I can get some hash? I'm really looking for hash. I want to buy hash. And he's in the bar, and he says, sure, I can get you. And he said, how much you want? This man knew it was in. It's 100 pounds. So he comes back, and he lies. He says, I, one of my good buddies that I've known forever is cash for 100 pounds. And I said, look, it's already sold. We're transporting it. It's leaving town. We never sell in town. You know that's not the, the way the rules work. People have dibs on this. And really, I know a lot of distributors. And it's really important to keep that under our hat. That's why we were doing so good. And he goes, no, no, no. So he convinces everybody to let him have this 100 pounds. He gets busted. This guy at the bar turns him in, and he immediately rolls. When somebody rolls, they say, I'll tell you anything, I'll do anything. Just let me go, let me go, let me go, let me go. So he calls me up, and I meet him in a parking lot, and he's, we're talking. And he said, can you talk louder? I go, what's wrong? Just speak, come here closer, let's talk louder. Well, one thing leads to another, and the next thing I know... I'm sitting in federal detention, and they're sending me notes underneath the uh, door that I'm facing 25 years to life. Oh, my God. And would I talk about it? And I, the only questions that I answered is, what about my children? What about my children? Do you have kids? I have kids. And the only thing I would talk about was my kids. I stayed in prison and I prayed and I meditated and I made the walls speak to me and I did every magical incantation 
in my mind and in my heart, and, I, and they stuck me with really terrible people. The lady who was in my cell said, if you touch me, I'll kill you. And she had, was a violent, abusive person. And every woman I met in there was drug addicted or poor. Mostly they got poor women in there because they couldn't afford a phone to call their probation officer and they kept breaking parole. And then there was the homeless woman I met who gets herself arrested every winter so she has a warm place to sleep and a meal and a shower. I was in a room where you couldn't lay down and they kept it at about 52 and they wouldn't give you a blanket and you were in the little cotton thing so you were frozen. And somebody would sit outside the door and say, do you want something hot to drink? You want to talk? And uh, there was not a toilet in there either. So I hire a lawyer and he said, they got you. They got you with the keys. The warehouse had 16 tons. There was 400 grand in the van. They got you. Let's start negotiating a deal. Candy Can's parents are able to post bail, and her lawyers recommend that she take a deal. Remember, they are threatening 25 years to life for pot. And her lawyers are saying maybe they can get her off with just eight. But Candy Can has two young kids. She is determined to keep her family intact and remain free. My lawyer says, I can't do this. And it's a week before the trial. I can't change it. And a friend of mine from my network said, call this guy. So I call him. And he goes, well, you know, once a year... I like to do a big case for free. Oh, my God. I'll do this case for you. (sighs) So it's one week to trial. And he goes, you know, you have a 99.9% chance of going to jail. I go, yeah, that means I have a 0.01% chance of being free. Candy Can decides to tell them the truth. She doesn't use real names. But she's telling the jury her whole life, every deal, every smuggle. I was being attacked psychically by this prosecutor and attorney who was trying to make me out as a villain for society, for somebody who was not worthy of being a mother to my children. The prosecuting attorney said, she did it. We know she did it. This is a Hail Mary pass. You must convict her. She takes the stand to fight for her life and the lives of her children. And I cry. And I talk about all the years that, as a mother and a parent and struggling to survive, and how I thought of one banana is okay, a truckload of bananas is fine. Meaning, you know, You think a joint's okay? Well, why is a truckload of joints not okay? And I cry. And I pray. I have mirrors inside my shoes. I have every soul on the jury I'm communicating with. I'm using all of my psychic energy. My mother and father were there. My kids were there. The jury came back not guilty on all four counts. And I walked out of the courtroom. Candy Can mentioned having mirrors on the bottom of her shoes. Now, there's a superstition that mirrors reflect negative energy. So having them on the bottom of shoes reflects the negative energy away from the wearer, allowing the positive energy to flow in. Did we mention that I come from the hippies? Before the trial, Candy Can was under house arrest for 13 months. The trial took an enormous mental and financial toll on her family and kids. At one point, her parents encouraged her to flee and be a fugitive, but that wasn't a life she wanted. 
a life where you're always looking behind your back, looking away from your family? And for what? A plant that in our household 